All right, everyone, welcome to your first lecture. Um, this is going to focus on the appreciation of art, um, and it's also going to focus on um, chapter one of the art as well. So let's go ahead and get on with the first questions. Okay, so this question is going to focus on essentially art. So what is it? So if you have a notebook or if you have your phone or something with you, go ahead and just jot down a little answer to each of these. Um, so what is it? Essentially, what is art? Um, what do you think it is? If you're not really sure, um, why is art important? Um, and what do we do with it? Why is art, like, what do we do with art that we create, that we see, that we think about? What do we do with it? So I'm not really going to answer these questions necessarily for you. Um, I want you to kind of think about them, and then um, we might touch base on them a little bit later. So actually, I will. Actually, I'm going to answer them a little bit briefly. So art to me is anything that is visually aesthetic, um, but just because I think something is visually aesthetic does not mean that another individual is going to think something is visually aesthetic. Um, so therefore I can explain that, or hopefully that kind of explains how art is very subjective. Um, so what do you think it is? I think anything can be art. I think that scribbles can be art. I think that people who spend 15 minutes on a work, it can be art. I think people who spend 15 hours, 15 days, 15 years on a piece, that can be a work of art or composition. Um, I think it really just depends on what you think art is. Once again, that idea of subjectivity. Um, so why is it important? Um, you know, I think that art is an important part of society. I think we visually see things every day. We just don't necessarily interpret them as artistic or art wise, essentially, I guess, as you would say. So I think it's important um, because it helps us function. If we look like, if you look around wherever you're sitting right now, at your home, if you're at school, if you're at work, etc., um, just kind of look around and visually you see things. You know, you see a couch. Somebody had to design that couch so you could sit. Somebody had to design I'm looking around the room I'm in. I have a table, so I can set things on the table beside me. So I think there, art is important because it allows us to function. It doesn't always necessarily have to be a functional piece, but I think it allows us to function within society in an aesthetic way. Um, and I think it visually allows us to enjoy our surroundings, whether that's a picture on the wall, whether that's um, a piece of furniture, whether that's even just, you know, our children, family, animals, anything around us that we can see visually. Um, and what do we do with it? I think all three of those answers kind of simply tie into one another. Um, I think that we use it, you know, if it's functional, if it's a couch, if it's something designed, designed to be functional, we use it as the function. If it's not, then we maybe aesthetically look at it. Because some people will get a little confused and they're like, well, what is the purpose of art? Um, if you can't use it. And sometimes it's like, you know, sometimes we just like to have something nice. Sometimes you like to have a nice cup of coffee or a nice scoop of ice cream. Sometimes you just like to have something nice. And so I think art is something we can look at that's just nice. Um, maybe you buy a specific work from an artist that's up and coming. Maybe it's somebody who's famous. Maybe you just like looking at something. Maybe you need something that has, maybe you want to live near the beach or the ocean or body of water. That's kind of one of my dreams. So I like to have artworks that have scenes of those in them because to me they're very calm and serene. So when I walk around my house and I see those images, I'm like, you know, it's all, everything's good. You know, it's calm. I'm, I'm serene. I'm calm. I, you know, everything's fine. It's all going to be good. So I think that's what we do with that. I think we do with it what we want, whether we are the ones who create the art or whether we're the ones looking at art or buying art or critiquing the art, however, however we decide to do that. So that, that's my opinion. So you guys think about your own. Those are my opinions. Don't take those into consideration. If you thought differently, totally acceptable, however you thought um, to answer any of these questions. But I do think this would be interesting, especially since it's kind of the beginning of the semester for you kind of to just look back on these questions after you've gone through the course and see if your answers change any from the beginning of the semester until the end. So as we get into talking a little bit more about like art appreciation and essentially what art is, I want to just talk about a few things um, with art. So if we look at this figure here, I would say aesthetically I wouldn't probably necessarily purchase this item 
um, as a consumer and place it in my home. It's not, in my opinion, that doesn't mean somebody else may not. Um, I think aesthetically it's not uh, necessarily appealing. Um, historically, I think it's very appealing. I like the story behind it. Um, this is a, an Nkasi in Condi figure. Um, it's part of the primitive art figures um, from Africa. Um, it was considered a power figure of the time. Um, a lot of them would now be kind of referenced in modern terms as voodoo dolls. Um, so it was supposed to ward off evil spirits. That's why there's all these kind of nails and spears sticking out from the figure. Um, and then there's this kind of protruding belly button here. Um, that kind of is supposed to be like a portal, um, and there was actually, some of them actually had mirrors in them um, so that you could ward off the spirits and you could see like both sides, like the physical realm um, and the earthly realm and the heavenly realm. You could see all the realms of the um, figure and what it portrays. So like I said, aesthetically, um, you know, I would maybe not use this, but I also think African art in particular or primitive art, um, a lot of it does come from Africa, but not all necessarily, a lot of primitive art. Um, has a very childlike quality, and I feel like sometimes people are negative in terms of like doodles and just like sketches, and like not necessarily that we're negative in what children draw necessarily, but we're like, you know, they're just drawing stick figures or they're drawing these simple figures, but they're creating art, and really, in my opinion, their art is sometimes more powerful because they don't think about it as much. They're not trying to get this end result, they're thinking more about a process over a product. Um, and so I think that's really important when we are um, looking at art and seeing how art also is very influential. Like primitive art was very influential, which we'll talk about in just a minute, of many other arts as well. The Mona Lisa, you know, is part of the Renaissance um, by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, this is a very classic and iconic image. Um, very portrait style, very posed position. This is very much the epitome of Renaissance you know, the folded hands. Um, the gaze is a little bit different um, than would typically have been uh, portrayed there, but like the background and everything like this. But these, the people of the Renaissance era were influenced by uh, generations before them. So, you know, art is always being influenced um, by others. Um, so I think it's sometimes also hard to feel like we're creating new art, essentially, because I feel like sometimes we're always, we are always being influenced by something or someone, so it's kind of hard to say this is an original piece or this is originality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, but this to me is just as much art as um, the power figure that we looked at previously, so I just, I think that's interesting. And then I also want to talk about um, Marcel Duchamp's uh, fountain piece from 1917, uh, this is a very interesting piece. So this is what they would consider a ready-made. So there was a lot of critiquing. There was a lot of um, misfortunes, I would say, about this work of art. I think it obviously started a controversy. I think the artists knew what they were doing. Obviously, we're still talking about it today, almost 100 years later. So they made a point in their statement with their art. Um, but this was a big controversy, especially during this time period, um, because essentially they felt like that there was no credibility for the originality of the art that yes the person bought the artist bought the urinal they flipped it upside down and they signed it um, and they added a little bit of embellishment to it here and there but they said you did not you know you didn't make this out of clay you didn't come up with the design you just went to the store had this thought and this idea but who's to say that's not art to me that that is subjective that is because the time period said it's not art because so and so at a museum or a school or you know that's not to say it's not art. Now, maybe if you're working on a specific assignment and you're supposed to do X, Y, Z and you bring in this, maybe I, that would be understandable. But in terms of just truly creating art, um, I actually find this kind of fascinating um, that it was so controversial and that um, it has actually, like I said, like we're still talking about it today. So obviously it had a mark on history and I think it, that was very, very important in terms of... Um, understanding what is art and also appreciating art just appreciating the little things there were many artists who did a lot of ready-mades especially uh following Marcel Duchamp's portray and presentation of the fountain piece that he created um there are a lot of artists who would go buy items and then they would kind of make them their own like how he flipped his over and signed it and embellished it a little bit there were other artists who would take items and they would cover them like maybe 
they would cover them with different fabrics or they would take them and maybe use them as part of a different piece. So I don't necessarily think that's not art. I think that's a creative solution to a problem that an artist may be dealing with. So that's something to think about as well. Pablo Picasso is another famous artist um, who kind of um, was very radical in his composition choices. Um, he definitely broke away from the use of a traditional composition, um, especially the use of perspective here. Um, if we look at these figures, they're very geometric. Um, they're very mathematical. They're not, um, they're very, they have very, their edges are kind of softened, but they're not to the point where it would be portrayed like the portrait of Mona Lisa. Um, so I do think these very geometric, you know, we have the figure up here in the front, you can see this is the backside and then their face is turned or what we assume is their face is turned all the way around, but then it's almost like they have an African mask on. So I also think we, you know, once again, that influence of that idea of this is very primitive, um, in 1907, that would not have necessarily been considered, um, a positive, uh, influence into art. Um, but I do think that um, there's a lot of influence there. So this was actually inspired by um, Iberian sculptures as well as primitive African mask. Um, and Picasso was definitely all about breaking some rules. Um, and like I said, going beyond kind of that traditional use of composition, the use of perspective, etc. And then the next slide just is kind of shows an up close, you know, this is an example of an African mask, um, you know, sh that's portrayed, especially on these two figures. They all kind of look like they're wearing masks, but these two figures especially, um, you know, so it's kind of this idea of perspective of is the person turned all the way around with their face like that, because obviously that would be unnatural, or are they wearing a mask on the back of their head? Um, you know, the figures are almost kind of undefined, unidentifiable. Um, so just this is very interesting. So that's a little bit about appreciation of art, you know, kind of what is art, how do we interpret it? How do we think about it? What do we think about it? How do we use it, etc.? So, um, if you guys have any questions on that, please just let me know, and I'm more than happy to discuss it a little bit more with you one on one. All right, so moving into our chapter one, uh, Living with Art. So, in this chapter, you will learn to recognize why artists make art. Um, we're going to explain how artists create their works. Um, we're going to kind of describe the creative process and its objects. Um, and then discuss how viewers can respond to art. So the first section here is going to be about the impulse for art. So essentially what is motivating humans to make the earliest forms of art? Um, you know, where does the urge come from and what purpose is there to serve? Um, that first bullet point I think is really important. No society has ever lived without some form of art. I mean, this is going all the way back to cave paintings, um, you know, in France. Um, before people had languages, before they used writing and everything of that sort, how we have alphabets and things like that now, how we historic, well, we document everything a lot digitally, which will be very interesting and also maybe helpful, but it, I think it'll be very interesting for generations down the road. Um, I kind of came from the in-between generation of transitioning from written documents and papers and things to now doing digitally, so I feel like I kind of have a half and half, um, perspective and experience in each of those um, because of the generation and time that I grew up in or am I mean I'm still growing up but how I transitioned um, through childhood young adulthood etc anyway um, but really no society has ever lived without some form of art so even though people like I said didn't necessarily maybe have languages you know maybe they spoke orally but maybe they didn't actually write things down they could visually document their stories, their works of art, their families, their timelines. They could document his, historical events that occurred. You know, obviously we now, we have people, <coughs> excuse me, we have critics and historians and people who will go in and research these images and they will kind of focus more specifically on um, what stories are actually being told through this. Um, but it is very interesting because when the Paleolithic cave paintings were first discovered during the late 19th century. Um, scholars suggest that they had actually been made purely for pleasure during the rest, during times of rest from hunting or other occupations. Um, but then as you continue to look at them a little bit more, it seems that their work may be more meaningful. So a lot of people thought that they used them more recreationally to like let go of stress when they were kind of essentially hibernating. They would use this as their kind of like way to relieve that stress. 
Uh, but then there were also people who were like, no, that maybe they were doing it to relieve stress, but they were also documenting a part of that history. Um, so once again, think about these questions. You know, where does the urge come from to create art or the impulse for art? Um, and what purpose can it serve? Because it is, it is very purposeful. And then here's a little bit more um, up close of the figure here. Um, so this is from the Lions panel, um, like I said, located in France from 30,000 BCE. Um, a lot of historians, um, as they go in, um, this is one of the hundred caves in Europe where walls were decorated with images created during the Upper Paleolithic era, the latter part of the Old Stone Age. A number of these caves were already known when the marvels came to light. Um, and the cave created this sensation when the radiocarbon dating confirmed that at least some of the images on the wall had been painted 32,000 years ago, uh, thousands of years earlier than the accomplished style suggests. Um, you know, there's a mix of animals. There's lions, mammoths, rhinoceros, cave bears, horses, reindeer, um, red deer, um, bison, and others, as well as various palm prints and stencil silhouettes of human hands. Um, they used obviously materials that they had around them. Everything's kind of more neutral colors with the blacks and the reds and the kind of earthy tones here that they use. So they were obviously using things that they had around them. Um, they were either kind of scratched or engraved into the wall, um, into the rock, I'm sorry, um, where, um, you know, now we can go back and like, look at those images. They're able to date them to an extent. Um, so it is very interesting, you know, how long this has been around and how people then, you know, weren't probably necessarily taught how to use art or they weren't told to do this and put it on this rock wall, essentially, but they just did it. And now here we are talking about it thousands of years later. So I just I definitely think it's very, very interesting. And we've got a little bit more up close here. Some of the engravings, you know, the mark making as you look at the rock. It's, it's very, it's very, very interesting. Um, I think it's... Um, very interesting piece. Uh, so moving on. All right, so next we're going to talk about um, this image. So let's take a look at this one. Um, if anybody knows what the name of this is, uh, think about it for a minute. It's a fairly common one. Some people may or may not know it. Um, so this is actually called Stonehenge. Um, it's a remain. It's a remaining um, of an ancient structure that is located in the south of England. Um, it consists of several concentric circles of megaliths, megaliths meaning a large prehistoric stone. Um, it was created in several phases beginning around 3000 BCE. Um, so it really must have taken these people a lot of time. You know, this is a, created a very, very long time ago. So not only were stones hard, uh, these stones around were kind of, you know, hard, but each stone was carefully shaped by stone hammers to be fitted with the other. So you know, they didn't necessarily have cranes and other construction pieces and mechanical uh, devices that we have now to be able to move and construct this. This would have taken a very, very long time to complete um, because it was created so long ago. And these would have been handmade, which, you know, we consider all types of art handmade. But this was, you know, literally they would have to have moved and created and structured these rocks and this awesome lodge, essentially, and this figure and this concentric circle. Um to kind of get their ideas and details. So let me show you the next page. You can kind of see the circle formation that's here. Um, so, you know, these very large stones are megaliths um, surrounded by this circular ditch. Um, there's a lot of theories about why stone hinge was built. Um, and we'll actually get to that in just a minute when we talk about some of the functions of art. Um, but I do find this very um, interesting. Um, you know, that once again, this is still standing. I feel like a lot of times, I feel like a lot of products, especially in modern times now, just in general, just like things you buy at the store, things you have in your home and things like that, they don't really last very long. And it's because we're such a mass produced society that we make things or we want things made so, so fast so we can have them. We want this readily accessible life and items and materials. And we're very materialistic. Even if we don't think we're materialistic, we still like to have our materials around us and we like to have them readily available and able to use them. We want everything fast, 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 fast and instant. Um, so to me, it's just very interesting that they did not have the tools that we have now. They did not have all these things. And this structure still, for the most part, pretty much standing in its original state. And that these people, that was what their time and, um, you know, life was essentially devoted to at, during that time period that it was occurring, that they were building these concepts here and these stones and et cetera and things like that. So I just, I just think it's very, very interesting. 
Um, this was erected in the Neolithic era um, or the New Stone Age, um, and that's kind of named for new kinds of stone tools that were invented, uh, but it also brought many other advancements such as the domestication of animals and crops and the development of technology of pottery um, as these people begin to discover that fire could harden certain types of clay. So as we move into the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more and kind of keep briefing on that. Um, so with pottery, storage jars, food bowls, and all sorts of other practical objects came into being, um, the world's oldest pottery seems to go far beyond purely practical needs. Um, so this is an elegant painted ceramic vessel. It was made around 2650 BCE um, in what is now China. Um, the pot is functional, um, but its ornamentation is not. So there was a lot of care and skill that went into this. Um, you know, it's covered with these concentric lines that change directions several times across the pot. Um, you know, we might turn to the um, idea of this was maybe the possibility of um, exploring new technologies during that time. So when you think about this, you know, think about what were the limits of clay. Um, you know, many early potters wondered, you know, nowadays, especially if you work with clay or any type, you know, you can buy air dry clay at the store um, and you can create your own little structures. They may not be grand. They may not last entirely long as regular pottery, but you can still go do that. And, you know, it's kind of a quick and easy concept, but you know, in this day, you know, what could be done with it? How could you make it more pleasing for the viewer? How could you make it functional and pleasing as well to where you could actually use it? But maybe people also wanted to have these decorative components um, as well. So it was this idea of constructing meaningful images and forms to create an order and a structure, but also to explore these aesthetic possibilities to kind of combine the two ideas. Okay, so we're going to stop there for now and in the next slide I'm going to focus more a little bit more on what artists do.